And for the last 10 months, we've been asking this question, is Portland over? And tonight, we begin a series of reports focusing specifically on the homeless crisis. And I start tonight by taking you to a neighborhood that's simply overwhelmed. It's a snapshot in time documenting the cycle of this human tragedy. From above, you can't deny the stark reality. This is what Portland's other epidemic looks like. It spreads across the city into neighborhoods, along streets, alongside highways, next to homes. Unlike COVID, this epidemic has no vaccine or booster, and it's getting worse. This is what it looks like from the ground. Men and women living in makeshift shelters, in tents, under tarps, existing among piles of garbage and filth. Some are living in broken down trailers parked along the street, surrounded by piles of personal belongings, trash, and rats. They've been coming up underneath the tarp and stuff, and like we can hear them because they crawl on things. I didn't know rats were so smart. They're like little ninjas almost. The rats have now invaded nearby homes. Those living here have seen their neighborhood become a human disaster zone. Needles now litter the sidewalk. They've been threatened by some of the people living on their street. They don't feel safe. It's a health hazard. Their pleas for help, ignore them. They've been there for two, almost two years now, and um, no one has removed them, so I think it's time for them to actually do something about it. This is what Portland's human tragedy looks like. Welcome to Southeast 94th and Pardee. I've, I've been here since the summertime and when they moved the people from over that, that area, they all came over here and then we all kind of got bunched together. And now I think it's because before we all, we all followed the rules like the six feet apart stuff, you know, so like they weren't really bothering us. Lahua is not just a statistic. She's a woman who ended up homeless. So and then now there's a bunch of trash here that wasn't here before, a bunch more people that you wasn't here before. So now we all have to move. Lahua doesn't want to be here. She didn't choose to be homeless. Um, a roommate that didn't pay rent. So therefore we couldn't catch up. It was already too far gone that we couldn't catch up. This morning, Lahua has a decision to make. But the way they post these notices are ridiculous. They post them back in the trees where nobody can see them. The city has posted green notices declaring this an illegal campsite, giving campers 10 days to move. Crews are set to clean up the site tomorrow. Lahua isn't surprised. She's been through this routine before. These people come and they, they'll, they, they'll take all your stuff and they'll pack it all up for you. It doesn't matter if it's garbage or whatever it is. They'll pack it all up into one thing and you can come. They'll leave it, they'll leave it out here on the trail for a few days and if you don't if you don't come get it by then then they'll take it to a locker so that means anybody can come by and take your stuff so it means whatever you did have is gone where do you go when there is nowhere to go they'll go either down the trail or up the trail there's a lot of people don't really have any place to go early the next morning the cleanup begins a yellow box truck has arrived. Rapid response cleanup teams are clearing up campsites, trash, and garbage, packing the truck full. But their efforts only focus on this specific area where the notices were posted. Most of the homeless who were here simply moved a few feet down or up the trail. The next morning, piles of garbage and debris have replaced most of the tents and tarps. Cleanup crews will return in a few days to pick up what's left. Lahua and her boyfriend didn't leave. She's staying in a trailer parked on the street. Okay, man. Take, Take care of it. Yeah. Her friend tells me she's feeling sick and is staying inside today. Many of those who used to live here haven't disappeared. They're just waiting, waiting to see where they'll go next. They did a cleanup yesterday here. Did you have to move during that cleanup? Oh, yeah. Where did you move to? Uh, I just packed everything packed up. I haven't moved yet, so just kind of waiting to see what happens. And then you'll make camp somewhere? Yeah, pretty much. Just clean up by here. Marshall has been homeless for the past seven years. He used to have a good job. Then things spiraled out of control. 
He now has addiction issues, like a lot of people living out here. Has there been any outreach to you, like to say, hey, Marshall, do you need some temporary housing? Do you need permanent housing? Has a team come around, anything like that? Uh, uh, not really, not that I've noticed, or not to me personally. What's the hardest thing about being out here? I mean, you've done it for seven years. <laughs> it's all hard. It's all hard, and it doesn't get any easier. But I mean, what, either roll with it or get ran over. I mean, what are you going to do? While Marshall waits, another person has already moved on. Do you think you're getting the mental help that you need to get off the street? Yeah, I, I think they do what they can. Uh, but again, it's about me setting goals. And, uh... Bobby says he suffers from depression. He's been homeless for a few years. Uh, it's been about four or five years. But how do you survive out here? Uh, just every day, just set goals and um, small goals. And, yep, it's every day set a goal. If they tell you to move on after a cleanup, where do you go? Until that sheriff roll out, man, I, I mean, I leave, no conversation, and then I come back. To the same spot, usually? Uh, well, not exactly the same spot, but you know. When you talk with those out here, when you listen to their stories about how they ended up here, when you see the addiction problems, those with mental health issues, you're moved with compassion. But what if you lived on this street, the crisis unfolding feet from your front door? After every cleanup, the cycle starts all over again. Where do you draw the line between compassion and tolerance? Honestly, they're wasting their time and the taxpayer money. These people are going to be right back. The city does not have compassion for these people or compassion for us. These people need help. Todd Littlefield lives in the heart of Southeast 94th and Pardee. He's been outspoken about the city's lack of response. I'm not going to offer an excuse for why we're forgotten. It's clear that we're forgotten. It's clear that the city does not care. They have no compassion. They have no compassion for, for us, the neighbors, or the people that are on the streets being assaulted every night. Mari Factor feels unsafe. She can't let her children play outside. I can't let my kids ride on that trail, beautiful trail that's very long. It's not so beautiful anymore because it's scary. So many homeless people there. Mari says some homeless have entered her fenced yard. So that's why I have to like lock all my back doors, windows with wood, just in case. I don't know what we're dealing with. I have my big yard and I can't let them out and play. How is that possible? <laughs> yeah. It's not fair. I lived in a neighborhood for over 40 years, so I, I haven't ever seen it like this. Martin Johnson is compassionate towards the homeless, but says what's happening here wouldn't be tolerated in other parts of the city. I understand that people are homeless, and I understand there are some that have and some that don't, and they need it. But we have a crime situation in our way. We have uh, stolen cars back there. They steal the catalytic converters off of cars. My neighbor left and right and they and we have needles. We have prostitution. We have a guy that's got a bike situation. We're stealing bikes. As for the cleanup that just took place. So that doesn't mean anything. You know why? It, they, they, it's like a Band-Aid. They're there for that moment and you take the Band-Aid off. You still got the wound. This is the last thing that we wanted. You know what I mean? We, we, we hate it's so hard to do simple stuff like charge your phone, wash your hands or your face. This is one of the visible wounds. Will and Ashley have been living in this dilapidated trailer parked on the street. They've been living in this neighborhood for over a year. They used to live in a tent across the street. How long have you been living in this trailer for? Uh, about four months. They just had a cleanup here and you guys didn't have to move? No, no, we didn't because we are not in a tent technically. So. They never, they never told us we had to move because we were on the street in a trailer. How did they end up here? In the past two years, Will and Ashley faced one crisis after another. They couldn't pay rent. They lost jobs. There were family issues. There was COVID. They have two children now living in foster care. Ashley's two other children from a previous marriage now live with her former husband. I spent as much money as long as I could on hotels for us before and we were waiting to get into programs the the list for a lot of shelters were full and it took maybe two months mm -hmm. it was really fast it was really fast it was really fast and it sucked because we had no control over it like we 
We had no control over it. We tried to stay with family. This is the place Will and Ashley now call home. But a lot of this stuff just got like brought in here really fast because it was raining when we first started. It, when rapid response came also, and it was just stuff we had to bring over. And some of the stuff outside is mostly like storage bins to put all this stuff in. But it, you know, there's rats out there and they get all over everything and they're so gross. And so before I bring it in here, I don't want to clean it off. But it's hard to do that kind of stuff because we have to get like napkins and water. Compassion versus tolerance. Is it compassionate to let people live like this? Is it right to tolerate people shooting up drugs on our streets and sidewalks, letting garbage pile up while ignoring neighbors' pleas for help? Is it compassionate to tolerate those living in cars, trailers, and tents who are fighting the demons of mental illness? Back at Southeast 94th and Pardee, the tents are returning to the site just cleaned up. Soon more will pop up the garbage and human debris will start piling up again, and Portland's cycle of human tragedy will repeat itself. And this is what 94th and Pardee looks like tonight. This video taken just this afternoon, more tents are moving back, another trailer covered in tarps is now parked on the street, all this after the cleanup about two weeks ago. And this is the cycle that continues to repeat itself over and over again. Now, one of the three neighbors here told me that the addiction and drug issues is what the real problem is, homelessness a result of that. That's true for many living here, but you can't say that for others we talked with. The metro area now has more money than ever before to solve the homeless crisis. Voters approve that tax, and it's up to us to make sure that money is spent well and that their approach over the coming months is effective in stopping the cycle. We have to answer the key question here. Where do we draw the line between compassion and tolerance? We do want to hear from you. Email your comments to is Portland over at coin.com. And you can go to coin.com right now to watch extended interviews with some of the people living at 94th and Pardee. Then next Thursday, we continue our series with a look at a new program that's designed to prevent people from losing their homes because of the lack of affordable housing. Is Portland over all this month, every Thursday, here on Coin 6?